Everybody hear me okay? Well, it's great to see everybody. Thanks for joining us for day two of the Western Prosperity Roundtable Forum. This morning, I have the honor and privilege of introducing one of my bosses at WGA, Governor Greg Forte. Thank you so much, sir, for being here today and hosting us here in Bozeman. It's beautiful. Thank you for making the weather so nice for us, too. On November 3rd, 2020, Governor Giaforte was elected Montana's 25th governor, receiving more votes than any gubernatorial candidate in Montana history. With the largest margin of victory for a first-term governor since 1920, over a 100-year-old record, by the way, Governor Gianforte helped move the state forward with both conviction and purpose. The governor has dedicated his career to ensuring the continued success of Montanans. He's founded five startups, and as it relates to today's topic, has championed pro-housing reforms and spearheaded the state's response to the housing shortage. Last July, the governor established the state's housing task force, which was charged with providing recommendations to make housing more affordable and attainable for Montanans. Housing, housing is not only a prominent issue here in Montana, but across the West. As a result, Western governors adopted a housing resolution this past December that recommends actions to share best practices across our states and improve federal housing programs and resources so they function more effectively for Western states and territories. And just yesterday, Governor Gene Forte signed four zoning reform bills into law to encourage smart and proactive housing development at the local level and addressing housing shortages across Montana's communities. I'll say not bad timing heading into today. So please join me in welcoming our host, the 25th governor of the great state of Montana, the Honorable Greg Gianforte. Thank you, Jack, and uh, welcome. Uh, just in case you didn't know, the sun always shines in Montana. <laughs> the, bur the, the fish are always rising, the birds are always chirping, so I hope uh, Bozeman takes care of you. And uh, I'm joined by the First Lady, my wife Susan. We just celebrated 35 years of marriage. And Bozeman is our home, so it's great to have you here. Um, I look forward to discussing some of the things. This, I, I really believe that uh, attainable, affordable housing is the number one issue facing hardworking Montanans today, and that's why we put such a priority on it. It's really at the center of the American dream, home ownership or having access to a rental unit that's affordable, uh, and it's just part of earning a good living, raising a family, and being part of their community, and being able to retire comfortably. That's the kind of the embodiment of the American dream, and this is why this is such an important topic. Um, there's been a lot of ink spilled uh, about how the American dream is dying. I don't buy that. Uh, I'm a fan of the American dream, and I think working together, we can make it more attainable for more people. Um, that's why I'm thrilled to be here today with you to talk about how we can make, help more people prosper and achieve uh, the American dream of home ownership. Uh, some have called what we've achieved here in the last year the Montana miracle. I don't know about that, but uh, I'm pleased with our progress and we still have more work to do. Uh, I'll leave it up to you to decide uh, what, what else we should be doing. Uh, and I'm, but I am proud of what we've accomplished in a very bipartisan way uh, through the efforts we've put forward. Uh, and that's not to say we don't have problems. Uh, you've probably seen if you've driven around Bozeman, uh, you can only imagine workers getting up in the morning in a camper or after having slept in their car. Um, you don't have to look very far. You can drive around Bozeman and find it right here. Um, folks are living in campers and in their cars and in their shelters. And uh, others are spending a lot of time driving from remote communities where they can find housing. Uh, that puts a lot of miles on their truck. It takes time away from work. It takes time away from their families. And uh, because they just can't afford to live where they work. Uh, this includes teachers and nurses and law enforcement officers. Uh, these people who work in our community and are the backbone of the community should be able to live in our community. And that's why we've placed such a priority on this work. Uh, and it's really a supply problem. We just don't have enough supply. Uh, the shortage, um, as I said already, this is the number one issue facing working families. Uh, they're just struggling to get into a house that they can afford. And this is not a new problem. It's persisted for at least a decade. Uh, and it's, but it's gotten worse in the last couple of years as uh, with inflation and construction costs and all the other things that, uh, and, it's been complicated here in Montana because Montana has such a hot brand. I don't want to blame it all on the TV show, but we got a lot of people moving here. 
uh, for good reasons. You see it when you're here in, in Bozeman. The quality of life is unmatched, and the, particularly the pandemic uh, made fleeing concrete jungles that much more desirable, uh, and they're coming to our open spaces, uh, and uh, we welcome them, but we need to have houses for them. So to just look at the numbers, over the last 10 years, uh, between 2010 and 2020, we've seen a 10% increase uh, in the number of people in Montana, and the number of new doorknobs has gone up by less than 7%. Uh, that is the root of the problem. Uh, we have more demand than we have supply. Over that same period, rental vacancy rates uh, dropped from uh, nearly 6% uh, to slightly more than 4%. Uh, and in some areas, the rental vacancy rate hovers below 1%. So it's hard to find a place. Uh, and rents will continue to rise in a constrained supply environment. Uh, this is just basic economics. Uh, and there's really been a confluence of factors that have driven this, uh, and these have been well recognized uh, and uh, addressed. Uh, and uh, and it's without decisive action, it was just going to get worse. And that's why we took the actions we did, uh, driven by increased consumer demand, rising inflation, national supply chain breakdowns. Uh, the cost of a building a new home has really soared. Uh, private residential construction cost uh, skyrocketed 18.4% nationally between 2021 and uh, 2022. Just in a single year, it went up almost 20% the cost of a house, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, also, strict zoning and other housing supply regulations regulations are really a wet blanket on development that's preventing us from building affordable housing. Uh, they also increase costs and limit supply. In fact, the National Association of Home Builders estimates that the average cost of housing regulation in the price of a new home has soared 44% in the last decade. That's 44% increase just related to regulations. Uh, the National Association of Home Builders also reported that government-imposed regulations uh, account for over 40% of the cost of multifamily housing units. Uh, so while visiting a, from my own experience, while visiting a high density housing project in Missoula recently, I heard that um, most of Missoula, the whole city, only allows single family homes on individual lots, which when you build big homes on big lots, they cost more than multifamily units on smaller lots. That's just, again, basic economics. Um, and that, uh, on this particular project I visited, uh, permitting delays also contributed. Uh, it took them seven months to get a permit for this multifamily project in the city that met, there were no, they weren't asking for anything special, just a permit. That seven month delay add, added $700,000 to that particular project. And that had to get passed on to the people that were moving into it. Um, ultimately, some of the very communities that are at the eye of the storm in this housing crisis uh, haven't taken the steps necessary to update their growth plans and their regulations. Uh, they haven't made changes to their zoning mandates. Uh, and ultimately, they just haven't taken any action at all. And taking action has been long overdue. Uh, rising prices, mortgage rates, inflation, we talked about all that. Um, so when it comes to the health and well-being of our communities, we've got to act for the people that need affordable housing. Um, particularly the teachers and the nurses, the firefighters, the law enforcement officers, we want them in our communities, not commuting an hour from some remote place or living in a camper, even worse. Um, they make our communities stronger. Uh, and they shouldn't have to live an hour away. Um, so we've got to rise to, to reach this moment for solutions. Uh, ultimately, we've got to do two things. One, we've got to increase the supply of housing. And secondly, we've got to remove the barriers to home ownership. And that's what we've been focused on. So how do we do that? Well, 
Uh, in Montana, we are delivering on more dense housing, which will help with the economics. Uh, we're cutting red tape and regulations. In this last legislative session, I had 190 red tape relief bills, uh, and most of them made it to my desk. Uh, we're also enacting innovative free market solutions that uh, help solve the supply side problem. And we're also building a stronger workforce. If you want more houses, you need more carpenters and plumbers and electricians. So we've been taking action in that area as well. So how have we been doing that? Well, um, we identified the problems. We brought a really diverse group of people together, uh, starting last summer, chaired by Chris Dorrington, who's our director of Department of Environmental Quality. And uh, we told them to cast a broad net and put their best ideas down. And I would encourage you, both the, the two reports from the committee are available online. I would encourage you to download them. Not every solution is right for every community, but they did really did a remarkable job of looking broadly to find solutions. There's no magic wand and there's no one thing that'll help, but we put a, a, a package together. Um, that's why days like today are important as we share some of the best practices. I'm sure we'll be able to learn from you as well. Um, so we've just, the bottom line is we've got to change our approach. So let me share a little bit about what we've done. Um, we talked about the task force. This task force included Democrat legislators, Republican legislators. It included state agency heads. Uh, it included county and city leaders. Uh, it included economists and researchers from the university. It included uh, really a diverse group of stakeholders uh, from the business community, the home builders. I served on the committee from the Montana home builders. Um, we had, uh, we also had nonprofits, Habitat for Humanity participated. So it was really a broad selection of people. Um, and each of them brought a really important voice uh, to the conversation. Um, and they dug deep and came up with some great ideas. Um, so first, uh, the first thing we came out of the committee was really streamlining permitting. Uh, just to remove the friction between the state and the private sector and local communities. Uh, and we're cutting red tape by doing that. And as an example, in July 2020, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality was receiving a record number of subdivision permit applications. Uh, and they were backlogged. They had over 500 subdivision applications that were overdue. Uh, now, you think about that, if an average subdivision is 10 units, that was 5,000 housing units that were caught up in bureaucratic tape. Well, thanks to Director Dorrington, um, they just changed the way we did it. We changed the leadership in the group, we got some people working overtime, and I'm proud to tell you there is no backlog anymore. So, subdivision permits are getting issued on time. We're also focusing on red tape that drives up housing costs uh, with other roadblocks. Uh, as was mentioned by Jack, I just this week I signed the Montana Land Use Planning Act into law. Uh, this measure cuts red tape, streamlines permitting as well, and requires local jurisdictions to adopt a host of pro-housing reforms. This was a delicate issue because uh, the local communities really don't want to be told what to do by the state. But there was such a strong outcry for the people of Montana that we had local municipalities that were initially opposed come to the table and embrace these things. It really was a forcing function to get them to do this. So with this Land Use Planning Act, we broadly reaffirmed that landowners have the right to construct starter homes. We were not gonna use exclusionary zoning to prevent property owners from building what was needed in the community. Um, it also requires that local governments adopt pro-housing reforms from a menu of options. Uh, and it requires local governments to reform zoning regulations to meet projected future housing needs. And one of the benefits of doing that is once we have a housing forecast and housing plan, when a developer comes in with a proposal, if it matches the plan, if the plan's already been certified through public comment, we don't have to go through a broad uh, and lengthy process 
if it matches the plan that's on record that's already been scrutinized by the public. So this is really a streamlining measure. We also, one of the other problems that we had we realized was that all our existing funding mechanisms for infrastructure, particularly water and sewer, were focused on urban renewal. They only provided funds to replace existing water and sewer. Well, the problem we have is not exist, well, we do have problems with existing water and sewer, <laughs> but the problem it did not address is new water and sewer for new subdivisions. There were no infrastructure programs to pay for that. So in this last legislature, uh, we proposed $200 million to be used for low interest loans. In the, the bill was called the Homes Act, which is home ownership means economic security. And with this program, local municipalities can now get low interest loans for new subdivision water and sewer, but only if they adopt denser development. So it's oriented towards workforce housing. So this is an innovative thing we've done. It's now law in Montana. We didn't quite get all the money we wanted, but we got a lot of it. So this is going to open up the door for more starter homes. Um, there are a host of other bills uh, that, made, uh, that we made law and encourage responsible proactive development. Uh, and we'll continue focusing on removing uh, unnecessary roadblocks. Uh, we're as I mentioned, we're giving home uh, landowners the ability, more freedom to build starter homes. Uh, for example, a family should be able to build an accessory dwelling unit on their property. Uh, ADUs help grandparents who want to be close to their, their kiddos uh, live closer. Uh, so that's a bill I signed into law. Any single family home can now have an ADU uh, in the state of Montana. Um, the, uh, and, we, and we got that done in this last legislative session. We're also giving landowners more freedom to build new homes in urban areas, particularly multifamily and mixed-use housing in commercial or retail zones. This will help housing increase supply and protect our rural areas by doing more infill in our uh, community. This is really a win-win. So now in Montana, anywhere you can have a single-family home, you can have a duplex. So we got that done. This was really a matter of uh, uh, ending exclusionary zoning that was constraining the supply of housing. We also um, uh, we're also streamlining another element of permitting by moving local design review away from volunteer boards who may not be as professional as the professionals. Um, and instead solely to employees of the local jurisdiction. Um, we further clarified that local design review standards uh, form local jurisdictions must be clear, objective, and necessary uh, to protect public health and safety exclusively, not subjective rules that are subject to various interpretations depending on which way the wind's blowing. Um, everyone agrees uh, now is the time for really bold action. I think we've taken a lot of big steps this last session to increase supply. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm excited about what the results are going to be as these rules uh, get implemented and promulgated. Uh, the other area that we really focused on was increasing the wor trained workforce in the buildings trades. Uh, in the end of the day, if you want more houses, you need carpenters, plumbers, and electricians. Uh, now more than ever, uh, Montana needs these as well. Uh, that's why uh, we created the Montana Trades Education Credit in 2021. This program pays any employer in the state of Montana 50% of the tuition to send someone to trade school um, uh, uh, through a tax credit to $3,000 per year per employee, up to $25,000 per year per employer. This is the way we're build, in part building a better workforce. Uh, needless to say, it was not surprising that employers took great advantage of this program. And our budget in this session uh, dramatically expanded the funding for this program. So we're going to send more people to training. Uh, we're also expanding access to apprenticeship opportunities. Uh, when I took office, uh, government regulations really blocked 
apprenticeships, we, we had to ch change the ratios. Uh, Montana required two journeymen for every apprentice, two teachers for every student, who was one of the most restrictive ones in the country. By changing it to one journeyman to two apprentices, we quadrupled the number of apprenticeship opportunities in the state. And just in 2022 alone, we added 1,000 new apprenticeships in the country and 81 new uh, employer sponsors of apprentices. And we, I've been bringing people from the private sector into state government, and we hired a, a gal who used to sell all the John Deere equipment in eastern Montana. She now, and really championed original our diesel mechanics program. She's now the recruiter. Uh, she's on the road full time recruiting these employers and expanding apprenticeship opportunities. And it's going to create brighter futures for the individuals, and it's going to give us more houses. So everybody wins. Um, we have more apprentices in Montana today than we've ever had in our history. Uh, so we're working together to develop this skilled workforce. So I'll wrap up my comments with this. Uh, each and every day I'm focused on opening doors of greater opportunity for Montanans. Uh, so Montanans can thrive and prosper and achieve the American dream. I've always said that Montana exports beef, we export grain, and we export our kids because we don't have enough good jobs here. And that's really been the focus of our administration and home ownership is a key piece. So every day, Montanans are working hard for the American dream. They're, they wanna earn a decent living so they can raise their family, contribute back in their communities and retire comfortably and in the process, own a home. Uh, working together, we've taken these steps and made real progress, uh, but there's no question we have to do more. And that's why I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel today and taking some of those ideas away. As I mentioned earlier, some have called this the Montana miracle. Uh, you can judge, but I firmly believe uh, we can do this in this country, that uh, we can rise to the occasion. Because ultimately, uh, we must remain focused on expanding these opportunities of supply so folks can have a home. Thank you so much for being here. I'll ask the governor to stay up here and have our first panel join him on stage, please. So yesterday, thank you, Governor, for first and foremost for your leadership, and now you, now we can call you a miracle worker, right, with this Montana miracle. So that's that's a nice new title for you, uh, but certainly appreciate your leadership on this critical issue. So yesterday we heard from experts working hard to build capacity and provide services in their communities that are critical to the well-being and prosperity. Our panels today will explore community infrastructure and how this critical infrastructure supports bright, vibrant communities. As the West grows, housing shortages have become increasingly pronounced in communities both large and small. In this panel, the governor will moderate a discussion on how states can address housing shortages by engaging in responsible and proactive development strategies working within states to increase housing opportunities for all. So given I've already introduced our distinguished moderator, I will next briefly introduce our other panelists before turning it over to the governor. Emily Hamilton is a senior research fellow and director of Urban, 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 Urbanity excuse me, Project at Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Chris Dorrington, who we've heard about already a little bit, director of the Montana Department of Environmental Quality and chair of, the Gov of Governor Gianforte's Housing Task Force. Dave Anderson, managing director of growth management planning at the Washington State Department of Commerce. Christina Oliver, Housing and Community Development Division Director at Utah Department of Workforce Services. And last but not least, Andy Hill, Director of the Community Development Office with the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. Governor, pass it to you. Yeah, thank you, Jack. And um, you heard from me, so now it's time to hear from these experts. Uh, I'm gonna throw out some questions, but I'd like to have some back and forth here because we're really trying to uncover new ideas. Uh, I wanna start with you, Emily. Um, you study this housing crisis nationwide. Uh, what have you observed and what, uh, what challenges are unique 
to the Rocky Mountain West that you could highlight for us? And then I'll let other people contribute on that as well. Emily? Sure. Thank you so much, Governor. Should I come up here to do the... Just... Okay. Perfect. Um, well, one thing that we're seeing is that uh, the housing affordability problem that was once limited to a few parts of the country, it was primarily a California and a New York City problem, is increasingly affecting households across the country as a whole. Um, the same share of households are renting, roughly, as were in the 1960s, but the share of income that they're spending on rent is increasing rapidly. Um, and if we look at the home ownership side of things, the median house price across the country as a whole is today uh, at its highest point after adjusting for inflation than it has been since before the financial crisis. And in some parts of the country, this, this problem is, is really um, accelerating. And Montana, which used to have a median house price below the national median, now has one well above it. And here in Bozeman, it's double the national median. So home ownership is increasingly out of reach. Uh, but luckily, state policymakers are increasingly stepping in to set some limits on the local zoning rules that are the root source of constraints of housing supply, as well as the uh, very long approval processes that you mentioned. Um, so I'm very encouraged to see states uh, like Montana, as well as uh, others across the country, providing leadership on this issue to make it possible to build more housing at more affordable prices. Yeah, great. So let's focus on the problem first. Who'd like to go next? <laughs> Chris? Yeah, uh, thank you, Governor. I, obviously, in your intro, you addressed some of the challenges at my agency. Uh, I think a legacy of my agency and a combination of local government, state, and, well, fe federal, state, and local government regulations pose on the development and delivery of homes. And so I think, I think that is a real part of the problem. Uh, my agency was, w was really looking in the rear view uh, for solutions on a forward-looking problem. Uh, what we chose to do, uh, Governor, which you know, but is to really well communicate a solution set that, w um, uh, that delivered our portion of the housing problem, which was e effective uh, subdivision uh, permitting while not losing our protective element. We are given statutory authority to be protective. But if we do that really, really efficiently, communicate the process well, and then deliver on our commitments, which we hadn't for some time, uh, we turned that around. But that gave uh, builders a lot more confidence, a lot more forward insight, able to acquire materials in bulk, and then deliver on the schedule that they're making commitments to their customers. And I would just add, uh, I think because of your leadership, we have, you have really changed the culture at the Department of Environmental Quality. I, very much. not very uh, encouragingly, I used to refer to them as the Project Prevention Department. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there was a game that was played, it was kind of hide the prize. Very and uh, through, Chris's leadership, he has introduced a new concept to state government called customer service. It is. Yep. And we, our posture is to get to yes, we're going to dot every I, we're going to cross every T, but here's what an applicant has to do to get a permit. We're not going to play hide the prize anymore. That's right. Yeah. So. So this, is, uh, this has been a problem in Washington for uh, a long time as one of the big West Coast metropolitan states. And so we've, you know, we've started having this conversation a long time ago. Um, we've made a lot of progress over the years. Uh, most recently, uh, it, it, it's strange as a state that's a, a pretty much a blue state, we ended up adopting a lot of the same zoning reforms that the state of Montana adopted. A lot of the things you heard from the governor, uh, we've, uh, we've taken a lot of the same approaches. Um, allowing a greater variety of housing units, uh, housing types at the local level, um, relaxing rules on accessory dwelling units. We did that a bit back in the mid 90s. Uh, we, take more, we took more steps on that, um, more steps away from sort of discretionary design review, more toward a more objective administrative process. A lot of those things happened that session, this session, and they've been, they've been in response to to the housing crisis, and um, this has been a long, a long-standing thing in Washington. Um, right now, our predictions show that we need a million new housing units over the next 20 years in the state of Washington in order in order to meet our growth. That's 
Um, sounds like a lot, but it's a big part of the sector, so we think it's doable if uh, you're willing to dig in. Um, this revolves a lot of complicated conversations um, between state and local governments on balancing um, the local values of self-determination with um, legitimate statewide interests. Mm -hmm. And it's not that different than the conversations we've had about a whole variety of other statewide interests. Um, and a big part of what we do in Department of Commerce is we help state agencies have some of those tough conversations with local governments. And those conversations are gonna continue. One of the, uh, one of the main things I've done at the department is we actually do a lot of training for state agency staff in the planning process. I'm a city planner by trade. So we have a series, we, we do training. It's kind of boot camp. It's kind of planning boot camp for traffic engineers and wildlife biologists. How to not get in trouble when you show up at a local hearing. Um, <laughs> um, and, a lot of value in that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that stuff is specific, about, probably about half of the material is specific to Washington, but the other I think, half I think is pretty broad. So I'm gonna make a copy of that available to Chen. Hopefully he can, he can share some of that material or out. So if you're, in a st if you're in a state agency and you're preparing to have some of these conversations, there's some, there's some pretty good tips in there. Um, I hope those, those can be beneficial to you. In terms of this particular issue, as this happened in Washington, the set of bills that were passing through, the coalition that showed up in front of the legislature to lobby for these bills over the past two years was one of the most diverse and unruly coalitions I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. It was the building industry and the environmentalists showing up on the same side of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, it was local governments and realtors showing up on the same side of the issue. We even had a lot of local elected officials showing up saying, you know, this is a collective action problem. I can try to do my best. I know this is gonna be a tough vote. I wanna make sure that the neighboring communities around me are on board with this too. So we had several local elected officials saying, you know, you're gonna have to make us do this. Um, so it was a huge coalition, and one of the things I tell a lot of the members of that coalition, if you're from the realtors, if you're from the builders, if you're from the environmental community, and you're showing up in Olympia to lobby on this bill, remember, we have 320 local governments who are gonna be having this very same conversation. Right. Your coalition needs to show up in front of the planning commission. They need to show up in front of the city council. You gotta show up at the local level if you really wanna make things happen. So uh, that's gonna be a big part of the work we have cut out for us at the growth management program over the next 10 years, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. I can't think of anything else I'd rather do. Uh, one last thing I'll say is there are thousands of planning directors in America, there are no more than 50 state planning officials. So it's great to actually be in a room where I get to hang out with other state planning officials. <laughs> it is so niche and I'm just so happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you, David. Christina, let's talk about the issue in Utah, what you're seeing. Uh, much the same as the other um, states in the Western region are seeing. Uh, we do have a unique structure in the state set up about five years ago. Uh, we have what's called the Commission on Housing Affordability. So it isn't just an ad hoc group. I actually staff it. I, I'm the master of what happens for nine months out of the year. I get a one month reprieve right after the legislative session. And the group is a diverse body. We have two representatives, one, one senator. We have the Home Builders Association, the League of Cities and Towns, rural communities, the Utah Transit Authority. It's an extremely diverse, our housings are, uh, our former uh, Senate President Wayne Niederhauser. We have a very diverse group of, of interests and an in, I think the most important function of this particular commission is that we come to, um, we come up with policy decisions, statewide policy decisions on an annual basis, which we work on for an entire eight months out of the year. And it's extremely beneficial because typically when you're bringing up land use modifications and taking away local determination in some cases, you'll have groups of individuals fighting and we used to call it, we used to have brawls, if you would, in the halls during the session. They weren't very fun. Over the past two years, our, our groups have come together based on an, a common understanding that sta safe, stable, and secure and affordable housing is at the utmost importance to our communities. It, it provides social economic advantages as well as stability in raising our families, which is extremely important. We have, um, so we do, we are chipping away at the block uh, every year 
This past year, we redid the subdivision, state subdivision code, uh, limiting public hearings. And I, I'm a former community development director, so I'm in the, I was in the trenches in one of the largest cities in the state. And the, if you've been to a planning commission, the people that show up are the ones that are angry. It isn't the folks that are excited that you're going to be putting in townhomes across the street. They don't, they don't show up. So providing a mechanism through state code that allows for a more narrowly tailored public process is actually of great benefit in order to, to loosen up the pipeline. Other things that we are looking at, and I think this next session, every session we have a couple of bills that we produce that change um, some of the uh, LUDMA, or, or Land Use Management Act. Um, and this year I think we'll be going just a hair further and we're excited. It isn't to um, take away local determination. There are definite pros and cons to everything that we do, but it is absolutely to increase the supply, which has been a, a significant deterrence for us, so. Yeah. No. Great, thank you. Andy, do you want to talk about Colorado? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Um, I'll say first that we, we notice in periods of high growth, people really clamor about sprawl, right? I mean, we all, yeah. we all um, recognize that. And we've learned, of course, that the only thing people hate worse than sprawl is density. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's frustrating. And, and, and it's hard to navigate and have <laughs> so true. productive conversations about how to, how to manage that. So, you know, we're talking a lot about local control, local determination. The, the NIMBY force, the neighborhood opposition force, is real and powerful. Yeah. And I think Colorado local governments have been trying to step out onto the edge and try new solutions and innovate, different customizations of tools that have worked elsewhere to make it work for their community, and bravo to them. Sometimes at their peril, recalls, threats of recalls are super real. And I'm sure you guys are seeing it in your states too. So. I think you know what we've been trying to focus on is how to help local governments combat that force, which is uh, you know it's, that's a lot of work. So I'm my ears are open today to hear what solutions have you all found. The other things that continue to come up that are very real challenges I know in all of our states, water availability and the cost of water taps in Colorado and many areas of Colorado are dramatically increasing the cost of the homes. So that's another thing that we're dealing with. Um, the other thing is a lot of tools focus on larger cities, but in Colorado we see, I'm sure just as you are, you know, sometimes it's the bitty towns, the little bitty towns that all of a sudden just explode. And by the time they get the staff necessary to deal with the issues, even recognize the issues, that ship has sort of sailed. Um, the final thing I'll mention that I think Colorado's been doing really well at lately is Funding, you know, funding communities, supporting affordable housing through uh, funding, supporting land use planning through funding, and really thinking about how to incentivize the behaviors that we want to see through that funding, but still give communities a chance to customize and adapt it to their markets and their situations. And I'm sure the same is true for you all. The solutions that work for a rural resort do not work for urban, do not work for rural. They're just totally different problems, different solutions. So that's what we've been wrestling with lately. Okay. Thank you, Andy. I want to zero in on that issue of, you know, we have very diverse communities. In Montana, our largest community is 100,000 people, right? And we have frontier communities with, you know, in some cases, 100 people. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about the difference in approach that's required for urban vor versus rural versus frontier communities? Who'd like to? I can kick us off Andy? with a yeah, short please. statement. Sure. I mean, I think um, the things that we've been wrestling with lately and having some success is, you know, the, uh, the AMI restrictions on a lot of our funding work for Denver or, you know, certain bigger cities. They don't work for rural resort communities or even our um, super rural and small communities. So that's one thing that I think we need to, to focus on. Um, I, I'm sure there's actually a lot more that's going to be said. I'll pass the torch. Well, Andy, in that particular case, though, sure. what do you do different? Well, if you can allow some flexibility. I mean, I think one thing I've been actually pleasantly 
surprise to see in Colorado is the legislature and the governor's support for um, opening up, loosening up the funding AMI restrictions. Mm -hmm. And so we just passed a program last year that, that uh, provided significant funding for affordable housing development for um, AMIs up to 170% in some cases, like rural resorts, which I think is great. Another solution that our Division of Housing has instituted is really kind of looking at those rural inverted markets where the urban tools don't work and seeing where you can loosen up deed restrictions, um, length of time, um, all kinds of okay. rules like that. Yeah. What other things have people found that you have to do different in frontier versus rural versus urban? I'll take the torch on this one. So um, if you're not familiar with the demographics of Utah, the majority of our population is along the Wasatch Front and the Wasatch Back. So our, you may have heard of the ski resorts, Park City, Deer Valley, Snowbird. The majority of our population resides in a geographically constrained area. We have mountains on both sides, so we're basically a long corridor. The rest of our state, we have the majority of the land is owned by the federal government, which poses an interesting uh, dilemma in a lot of our growth scenarios. But we have set up a situation where we have a funding stream that we're uh, enabling rural communities to go and purchase land or provide the uh, infrastructure development in order to to build new homes. We have certain uh, funding mechanisms for low interest, not only first and second, but we have an additional third um, capital uh, funding stream for the capital stack. What we do in the state is we get together as a group, and I know this sounds really hokey, and I, I'm, I'm gonna preface it by saying that, but on a monthly basis, the associations of government directors, myself, our planning coordinator, state planning coordinator, and a few other interested parties get together and we really dissect issues that are, are coming into play. And we're, we bring that into the Commission on Housing Affordability. We address it through various legislative actions. I will say, I wanna jump back to the planning component. Um, far too often our planners are in they're in the process. They're just simply receiving applications, they're processing applications. Long range planning, it used to be a thing. I will say it is severely uh, lacking in most communities, I would think in most of our states. So our ability to change state code in order to enable the development of multiple housing types, lower restrictions, the missing component in the, in the majority of municipalities, I don't wanna say everybody because there are some that do employ long range planners, but our ability to make the decisions that will enable smart growth, the infill, that, that's something that is across the board an overlooked component. And I can talk about our land use plan and our requirement for land use and, and moderate income housing that's been in place for a number of years when the time is appropriate. Yeah, David in Washington, you have rural, you have urban. How do you yeah. deal with that? Well, and I would say within, uh, there, I, th I think there's, there's lots of different kinds of urban and there's lots of different kinds of rural. Uh, but you could have, in an urban area, you could have some parts of even the same town that have a very different real estate market from other parts of town. And you mm -hmm. have to take different approaches within even a metropolitan area um, for different parts of the community really um, neighborhoods that are really struggling versus neighborhoods that are really uh, really doing well and you've got the same thing happening in the rural areas where you've got some communities that are very low growth very um, very very low land prices it's hard for somebody to go in and build a house and then sell that house for the market rate and make any money at it okay because they're competing with the national market for things like lumber and sure. building materials and even for labor if, if I live in Chelan County and I'm a good drywall contractor, I'm gonna go to Seattle during the week and come back home because I can make three times that amount, okay? So some of it is just production costs. Even if the land is free, production costs don't meet the price of a house in very rural, sort of slow, um, slow growing rural areas. But there's a handful of rural areas where the market is really hot and you've got this really bimodal income distribution. And that's where you've got some of the issues with area and medium income. If you're trying to use a measure of te central tendency to define affordability, and you've got this radical di difference between someone who's moving in from Seattle 
and you know can bring 700 grand into a community versus someone who's lived there their whole life and maybe their dad was a logger and that's really not an option anymore. Um, you've got to think about affordability really differently if you're talking about one of these destination communities that's been discovered. Yeah, Chris, in your work on the housing task force here, what did you observe about the differences in our communities? Sure, one of, one of the big things in, uh, so there's census rural, but then there's rural, western rural, it's not the same at all. In our, in our true western rural communities, what we ended up talking a lot of was um, updating, modernizing some of the some of the housing stock, not to increase supply like in the high growth communities. So you're looking at at rehab and uh, reutilization, uh, creating rental spaces above Main Street business in rural Montana. It's it uh, again faced a pretty stiff headwind uh, with regard to regulation on fire code, building code, energy code. I mean, you name it, code harms rehab. And so, a, a really, a really diligent focus on streamlining and educating uh, local investment into that. You'll sometimes get uh, a benevolent someone who updates uh, Main Street property and then creates three three apartments and that, I mean, it just rejuvenates that small community. On the urban side, uh, you, I think you really have to look at, uh, look at the handful of problems that are facing. In Bozeman, you have investors creating ADU uh, investment blocks, which take housing supply completely out. There's no turnover. Uh, and there's a great investment income there, but then your housing supply just lose, just lost 100 to 150 units of, of graduated supply. You can't get into, into an apartment because it's being rented out as an ADU. Uh, looking at that is a, is a very significant problem. And then the, the other problem I'd identify, which you tr touched on in your opening, is just incentivizing the use of existing infrastructure and extension of infrastructure instead of incentivizing fringe development, which in my world creates environmental problems where your individual well and septics creates a water use problem, creates a water nitrate and, and uh, really a groundwater issue. And it's a big deal here. Only so much water, every Western community faces it. And then wastewater is, becomes somebody else's drinking water. You don't want that, so. Yeah. Good. Emily, what would you like to add? I just add that uh, certainly there are different solutions that are correct in an urban context versus rural. And I think the Montana Miracle does a great job of addressing both with the multifamily that has to be a key part mm -hmm. of the solution in an urban infill context, but just isn't going to make any sense for rural communities. But the area where we've seen the most activity among state policymakers setting limits on local zoning restrictions is in the area of accessory dwelling units. Things like basement apartments or converting a garage to an apartment or a backyard cottage. Sure. And I think the reason there's been so much interest in that solution is because it can work anywhere. It can work in an urban neighborhood. It can work in a rural context where it might be the only viable way to add um, additional housing units. Um, so their, their flexibility is a key part of what makes them an appropriate area of um, state involvement in what um, has historically been a local issue. I just add that the details are crucial in determining whether or not accessory dwelling units will be feasible to build. Um, and I think states like Montana and Washington have really had the advantage of getting to learn from other states that have been um, working on this for a long time, Washington, Oregon, and California among them, in experimenting with the combination of rules that makes it possible for homeowners to add these um, units in all kinds of different contexts. I've done some research on state accessory dwelling unit policy that's um, available on your tables for anyone who's interested. I published that uh, a few months ago, but it's already out of date um, and will be updated this summer with changes in Montana and Washington among them. Um, and so we, we see that these can be an important part of the housing supply solution in all kinds of communities, but only if all the uh, barriers, regulatory barriers to homeowners actually getting them built are addressed. Okay, great. I want to focus on a, a new facet. We talked about it a little bit, and that is the friction that sometimes exists between state agencies, local municipalities, builders, 
I think, uh, Christina, you mentioned the brawls that you've had. Uh, just shine a light on that, identify the problem for us, and then talk about how you, how you kind of smoothed it over. Who wants to go first? Yeah, tell us. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, civilized brawls. Uh, we... Well, just an aside, uh, we are more civil today. Uh, Montana's territorial capital was Virginia City, and last year we got ownership of the original legislative hall uh, that was used from 1865 to 1875. There were 19 people in the legislature. They were rough, they were miners, they were merchants, they were ranchers. When we excavated behind the building, we found cleated shoes and human teeth. <laughs> it's a true story. So they used, if they couldn't use their words, they'd go out back and fight about it. <laughs> So we have progressed a little bit more <laughs> than that. Um, I like the qualify. <laughs> but that's a great story, and I love that you told it. Um, it really is civil discourse has become the anomaly when it used to be the norm. And in our state, we still believe in that civil discourse and working together across not only, you know, political beliefs, but also our, our approaches to solving and providing more um, housing affordability. Is it perfect? No. But the Commission on Housing Affordability was set up with a specific purpose to cut down on the negative overtures that happen every single legislative session. There are always going to be one or two topics that are passed. I promise you, again, this year it'll happen, that, not, um, that aren't supported by the League of Cities and Towns and the, Ut uh, the Utah yeah. Association of Counties. However, are they such drastic moves that those relationships break down? Absolutely not. So we are lucky, in a sense, that keeping the NIMBYs, I say that, but you know, everybody has, I believe everybody has a voice at the table, regardless of your, your uh, proposals and, and regardless of your view on what your community needs to look at. But I think that our overarching, consistent meeting every other week, I know I get to schedule them and facilitate them, and coming up with solutions that work for the majority rather than the, more, the minority provide for a lot of um, positive outcomes. Yeah, so. what, one of the things we learned in our red tape relief efforts was that everybody hates red tape, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless it's their red tape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What other advice would you offer the group about working between state and local folks? Chris? It, one thing I would just say is friction tolerance. I don't, think, I don't think you can enter this conversation without really intentionally engaging what is going to be frictiony ideas, understanding that many are just simply not going to agree. Uh, without saying we must address growth, where growth is a six letter, four letter word, and you have, to, you have to say, we're going to address it somehow, and we're going to have, throw out a bunch of ideas, many of which you might not agree with. In our, in our task force, we addressed quite a handful of ideas that, that people didn't feel uh, were very Montana-esque, but we're, we're also hearing from all the communities saying, please help us solve this problem. So we, and in my agency, I feel this often, we're oftentimes the good bad guy, where the community wants us to be the, the heavy handed, say no to this community, do not allow this growth to go forward, or we're the bad bad guy. And we, we don't want you to say no to it, this, because that's harmful to what we're intending. And we play, I think we play both pretty well, uh, but it, is a, it, has to, it, has to, it requires a very thoughtful approach. So when you wake up in the morning, are you the good bad guy or the bad? bad I'm guy? always the good bad guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> depends uh, on, depends on who you ask, Governor. <laughs> other, other other thoughts on this working? Yes, Emily. Yeah, if I could just add on to Director Dorrington's comments, I think your leadership on creating the housing task force worked really well in Montana, and Director Dorrington's job in in carrying that out did a really good job of bringing together uh, voices that were coming at the, the housing supply and affordability issue from many different perspectives. And I think one factor that made it work so well was the urgency that the task force and the uh, had and the very tight timelines that we were working on meant that everyone participating in task force discussions had to come forward with a positive 
vision of what could help address the problem in the short term, rather than just endless um, debate and discussion. And actually, the League of Cities um, came forward with important ideas that um, were reflected in, in That's the right. task force reports and ultimately in legislation. Yeah, good. Yeah. I'll just add, I mean, I, I like the, it, it certainly there's, um, it's important to make sure we just embrace the technical debate and bring in all the values and sort through them and find the solutions that are going to work. But complementing that, I think it's really important for the state to bring all the resources that they hear from local governments they need. So, you know, funding the, su the support to local governments for the planning work and providing technical assistance and listening to hear how is your market different? What is your opposition force look like? How can we think about different messaging that might be more successful? Um, and I think that's something that Colorado's done a lot of lately. Our, our division and our department in local affairs is um, special, I think. You know, we, we, in the division of local government, we focus on local governments first. We don't have another agenda. It's about helping them succeed, which I think um, builds a nice trust between a state agency and local governments. And so we want to utilize that. And in order to do that, you have to make sure that we're still listening and helping them solve their problems. So we do spend a lot of time and money on regional staff that live in those communities that help them develop sound project ideas, and then we fund them and try to get out of the way, too. So I think that's another just piece of that. Yeah. David, anything you want to add? Yeah, I've, I've got a few things to add. Um, one of them, I think, is kind of counterintuitive, which is I think one of the ways we really broke the logjam in the legislature was we actually had more people in the brawl, not fewer. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is at the state and the local level, um, we brought in some of the people that are almost never part of the conversation. At the local level, the people who show up at the public hearings are almost without exception the most housing secure people in the community. Sure. Okay? There was a generational change in the leadership of parts of the environmental community. And the millennials uh, who were struggling to afford a house and were much more amenable to living in an urban area had a really different view of what it means to protect the environment than some of the older folks who lived and thought the, the pinnacle of environmental responsibility was the one acre lot. That was a huge change. Um, it also changed in the legislature. I, I heard this as a talking point, so I didn't count the numbers myself, but I heard there were two people in the Washington legislature who rented, mm -hmm. okay? The people participating are largely governed by the people that already have a house and already have theirs. Making the coalition bigger, including the voices of the people that aren't as housing secure mm -hmm. and have a different view of what it means to have a good community really started to change the conversation. Sure. So that's, that's one thing. Um, I think there are a number of, of, of debates that were, have, have always been a big issue. We've, we struggled with these 20 years ago. And it was the debate over, should we grow or should we not grow? What are we gonna do with all these people coming into my community from somewhere else? California is always, always the favorite. <laughs> um, <laughs> And when the growth management was passed way back in the 90s, and I'm, I'm going a long ways back because we've been working on this for a long time. Um, one of the things we did when the state was passed was we established, based on the state forecast, you're going to have local growth targets and your plan over the next 20 years is gonna have a control total, all right? We're not gonna have the fight over whether we should grow or not because there's really no legitimate exercise of state authority that can tell somebody not to move there, right. all right? That's not a productive debate. We're not gonna talk about whether we should grow. We're gonna talk about how we should grow and what are the trade-offs, okay? So making sure you're focusing on the right thing is really important. A second, second piece of that is this debate uh, and, and if, if you've ever been to a local, if you've been to more than three public hearings, I think you've probably heard some version of these two statements. The first one is, for crying out loud, just tell me what I need to do mm -hmm. so I can pull my permit, okay? I want certainty and I want predictability. Yeah. The second thing you've probably heard is, this is my community, I love this place, I made an all-in bet on this community, 
I have a right to have a say about what happens in my neighborhood. Right? You've probably heard that before too, and it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to see that those are values the public holds dear and that exist in tension. So you've got to find a way around that. Washington's land use framework took a particular approach to that that's kind of weird. Um, a lot of states focus really heavily on predictability. A lot of states focus very heavily on a discretionary deliberative process, and they have these fights about growth over every subdivision, right? Mm -hmm. um, Washington was one of those for a while, and through the 70s and the 80s, we just, we would have trench warfare over an individual subdivision permit application. When the Growth Management Act was passed and when the Local Project Review Act was passed, it said, okay, we're gonna have a really deliberative process. We're gonna focus very heavily on deliberation when we're doing your comprehensive plan, when we're establishing a local growth strategy. But once that decision is made, emphasis shifts radically toward certainty and predictability. So once the plan's in place, once you've made that legislative decision, then there is no second guessing that decision at the permit counter. We're not gonna plan by permit approval. So Washington requires certainty at the planning stage. We have very uh, laws, laws governing permit review heavily favor um, certainty and predictability, but laws governing planning heavily favor deliberation. Hmm. That's how we have reached this debate, but that's a tension that is existing in every state planning framework. So those are a couple, a couple of ways where we've kind of managed this conversation over time. Yeah, so David, just if you could shine a little more light, since you've made that change, uh -huh. what's different? Um, I think what is different is that the, the, I think the big one is probably that all the fights over growth happen up front and there's a lot less of that going on on a subdivision level. So your ability to actually pull a permit, assuming what you're doing is consistent with what the rules say, um, is a lot easier. Uh, some of the biggest fights, I think, have been over projects that aren't consistent with the local law and sort of these competing expectations between people who think, well, this should be seized. Well, it would be a really easy if you did what the code said. You're asking for a change in the code. So yeah, that's gonna and take just a while. Pack how often do communities update their long range plan? Every 10 years. Every 10 years. Yeah, there's a okay. statutory 10 year periodic update requirement. We're, we're heading into that cycle right now. So and the state funds it. The state has $10 million a year getting their set bushels aside. Of Tomatoes ready. Yeah. <laughs> everyone's yeah. Everyone's getting ready. And you know, for, for us and our team, I'd say there's there is no substitute for shoe leather. You gotta show up, yeah. Yeah. you gotta build relationships, um, and you gotta be out there with them. Okay. Um, I, w I wanna uh, dive in on this a little more, particularly I mentioned uh, you know, over forty percent of the cost of a new home is regulations, exclusive zoning regulations, land use regulations. Um, what have you done that's been successful? And maybe we'll start with you, Emily. What do we see nationally to kind of peel this back and not have it be such a wet, wet blanket on development costs? Sure. Well, I talked a little bit about ADUs. At the other end of the spectrum, we've seen some really encouraging progress on multifamily housing, which is a because we're talking about projects that might add hundreds of units at a time rather than one, is the more scalable solution to our severe urban um, housing affordability um, and supply challenges. And while some of the biggest ADU um, success stories are now producing about one ADU for every 1,000 residents in their communities, which is great. I mean, that's a, a big change in a place like some of the California cities that that are really seeing a lot of this construction. Um, places uh, that are, have leaned in on the multifamily and transit-oriented development front um, are seeing a lot more construction. So where I live in Arlington, Virginia is a great example of this where about seven new apartments are being permitted each year for every thousand residents. So it's a multiple of the ADU front. And I hope that we can see statewide leadership um, leading to similar results in Montana's urban areas. Um, Seattle is another um, huge transit-oriented development um, success story that, that shows the 
difference that can be made in supply um, with that urban infill approach. Yeah, Emily, what, what regulatory change occurred to encourage those additional apartments? Uh, well, a lot of the focus has been on legalizing housing where it wasn't on the table before. So as, um, as Montana has done, allowing apartments to be built in areas that were previously only um, allowing commercial development, retail or office, um, that's very much been the Seattle and the, the Arlington, Virginia story. And the politics can be a little bit easier there, I think, because in some of these areas we're talking about apartments apartments replacing something like a dead strip mall. Nobody's happy with that dead strip mall, not, not the, um, the, the fiscal um, issues, not the landowner, not the neighbors. So allowing that um, to be replaced by um, a mixed use or exclusively multifamily development is really a win-win um, from all sides. So I think like ADUs, mm -hmm. um, that can be one of the least contentious areas to allow more housing to be built. Okay. What have other people done on the zoning land use front to increase housing supply? Sure, yeah, Christine. So um, in Utah, we have a, a commuter train as well as track stations. I call it the skeleton. We're <coughs> creating more robust bus systems. But part of the moderate income housing plan, element of the general plan, is a requirement. We, it's state specific based on your population that a station area plan is developed and we're pretty prescriptive on exactly what type of development can go in there. Mm -hmm. um, the non-compliance non with that, we have instituted not only a daily fee of $250 per day, which you have to pay up to $100,000 per year because there's only one time per year that you can rectify the situation. That increases to $500. All that money goes into affordable housing for subsequent years. And um, what causes that penalty to be invoked? If they don't create a station area plan that fits within state code. Mm -hmm. So we work with our MPOs in order to ensure compliance and then they report to my office and, and we provide that to the state legislature. Other things that we've tackled, you know, everybody's bringing up ADUs. Interesting factors such as your building inspector and fire marshal reviews. So every municipality has their own um, individuals that oversee the approval process and you definitely don't want to make them angry because then you know your project's not going to be approved for that six, eight month, 12 month period. So standardization of the review process and what can and cannot be allowed. We typically hear, and I, I can't tell you how many stories I hear a week of bad actors. Um, so we make changes such as I'll get internal accessory dwelling units. We had one municipality, I'm not making this up, that said you have to enter the accessory dwelling unit on the property from the northeast corner and it has to have a sidewalk that's no shorter than three feet wide. It needs to be a nice brick construct. It was extremely prohibitive. So what we did this last, last legislative, it's, yeah, it's true. The last legislative session is we narrowly tailored what the fire um, marshal and the building inspector could Allow, or could uh, um, re require, and then we took away the right of those exorbitant uh, re requirements for uh, existing build. Now, new build was a whole different story. So if there, you have a subdivision that gets 100 units um, approved, we had some communities saying, okay, you can have your 100 units, your 100 lot subdivision, but if you build an accessory dwelling unit or a mother-in-law apartment in your new construction, we're gonna count that as two building units. Mm -hmm. So now you have 100 lots and perhaps you have 70 homes. It's again, these are, everybody finds workarounds and those situations, we have one right now who's trying to preempt state law, which is wonderful. They passed a moratorium on May 2nd, it went into law May 3rd. Uh, but these are the stories that we work from. So this commission that we have together, we also have a non-formal group called the Land Use Task Force, and it's where we get into the nitty gritty setbacks. We restricted residential uh, road width requirements in the state because we were having communities that were, again, increasing the cost of housing by twenty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 per home because you're asking for 10 extra feet of asphalt that there's no reason for because you have your sidewalks and you have the ability of your fire department to reach the the unit. So those are the types of, we get into really nitty gritty minutia, which is where I thrive. Um, <laughs> and and so that's, that's really, 
it's, it's not all one-off. We gather the stories and then we pick what are gonna be the most influential as, as we make okay. changes. Yeah, Andy, what about Colorado? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, we, the, the most success we've had lately is really incentivizing local governments to make land use changes. So the legislature and the governor pushed hard for this, um, set aside almost $90 million to help local governments adopt the land use zoning changes you guys are all talking about. It's been incredibly successful. Um, about 100 local governments are working on that work right now and are adopting all kinds of strategies that they feel they can pass that will work in their market. So that's been a fantastic program. And our department even just added another $20 million to that work because you know, there's so much demand for it. And the, the ones that do the best job compete the best for the incentive grants, which help fund the, the pieces we've all been talking about that make it difficult for projects to pencil out, like paying for the infrastructure, reducing the fees, um, you know, things like that. And so that's been really uh, impactful, and I'm, I'm interested to see how far that takes us. As far as, uh, you know, state mandates, one that did pass this year was uh, a prohibition on growth caps. We have a few communities in Colorado that the citizens uh, passed a growth cap, and that's been seen as unfair for the communities right around that community, right? So that was a big, a big one. Um, and then, you know, Colorado tr made our first pretty bold attempt, frankly, to um, do some of the work that you all are talking about. And I think, you know, although it ultimately failed, it did finally raise for the debate. Okay, let's talk about this. Let's talk about local control and then step past local control and talk about the issues. So I'm I'm interested and excited about what next year's version might look like, and we'll build okay. from here. Great. David? Yeah, well, I have a few things. Um, one of them, I, I think when you're talking about both fees and regulations, uh, as Karina Steen alluded to, um, you can't talk about those in a vacuum, okay? If you're going to talk about regulations, you have to get more specific. What regulations and for what purpose? Mm -hmm. What fee and for what purpose? And a big part of what's happened in Washington's changes to housing laws is they're getting away from dwelling units per acre density calculations. They're asking local governments, stop thinking about the things that you think matter and start thinking about the things that really matter. Okay, so it requires local governments to allow a lot more neighborhood scale multifamily. It's not just this false choice between a single family house on a large lot mm -hmm. and a, a five unit. It's, if you've, got a, if you've got a building, okay, it's in a residential neighborhood and you can't tell if you walk down the street whether there's one house, whether there's one dwelling unit or two dwelling units in there, there's probably not a huge public interest in regulating it being one instead of two, mm -hmm. right? So fourplexes, duplexes, triplexes, uh, local governments have to allow a certain number of units per lot, okay? They can still regulate things like bulk and setbacks, those kind of things that affect what it looks like, but they can't regulate unit count. We're getting away from unit count is the way we define what constitutes a use. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing has to do with fees. We talk a lot about fees, right? Um, is we're asking local governments to get a lot more locationally refined when they're charging things like hookup fees, um, because the they you know there's a legitimate public interest in local governments charging what it costs to provide infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. That's fair, right? But you have to be you have to have a more refined look at what it costs. And generally speaking, small scale infill developments pay cost way less than the average cost. And if you're charging an ADU, the same connection fee as you would charge a, a, a large lot suburban home, they're probably overpaying on their connection fee. Mm -hmm. So we're asking people to get more sophisticated about that. Yes, please, yeah. Christina. We actually disallowed impact fees for internal accessory dwelling units for that whole purpose. Yeah. Now, that doesn't apply to detached, but mm -hmm. we agree that was one of the prohibiting factors. Mm -hmm. So. Hence the moratorium. Because if it's an internal ADU, it's already connected. Correct. Yeah. 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 Chris, all your, all your water's in the in the lawn anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, probably less on on uh, growth because I try to stay out of the the platting act side of uh, of what we're doing. More on the um, sanitation act. But one thing that really fits, though, Governor, is elimination of duplicate review. So one thing we did last year, we had. Uh, local or mun municipalities that hired an engineer there's a PE and they would submit stamp plans all certified board of professional engineers certified and then we would do an additional PE review on the PE submitted plan and we terminated that which was a huge deal for us and and, and eliminated is a significant part of our our review workload without any risk loss yeah. one specific example yeah, great. So I want to, I wanna, you brought it up, David, is, is infrastructure. We just started talking about that. And mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, we implemented this Homes Act mm -hmm. to particularly provide low interest loans to municipalities for water and sewer extensions to contiguous subdivisions that have higher density. Uh, talk about what you've done to deal with the infrastructure aspect of uh, housing costs. And maybe, Emily, you want to start? Sure. Well, I'll just give an example that um, builds on what David was saying about the differences in costs between different, um, different types of new construction. Um, one uh, small locality in the U.S. that's really embraced the um, two-unit type of development that's been so popular in recent um, local and state level reforms is a small town called Palisades Park, New Jersey. Um, and they adopted um, two-family zoning way back when they first implemented zoning in the 1940s, where almost every other um, locality in the U.S. went with single family zoning as their um, primary largest zoning designation. And nonetheless, Palisades Park was built out almost exclusively as detached single family houses initially because that's what the market demanded. But they are very near New York City and as housing demand and land prices increased um, starting in the 1990s, they've seen a, an overhaul of, of what their housing stock looks like with time tons and tons of duplex redevelopment. And while their neighbors have seen their um, effective property taxes going up and up over time um, in order to pay for public services, Palisades Park has seen their um, rates falling and they now have the um, lowest property tax rates among all of their neighbors, showing um, that the infill construction side of things can really be a fiscal win um, because more people are, are sharing so much of the same fixed infrastructure. Um, so to put a point on that, with more infill, they are actually able to bring property taxes down. That's right. Yeah, okay. Other ideas, Chris? One, one thing I would note is uh, the task force readily uh, understood the power of a line, that line being the city, city boundary. When, when, and it's from the perspective of margin. So builders will build, but they have a greater uh, access to margin building on the fringe or outside the city limits. You come inside, you have more regulation, you have more time, and time is money. So if you were to, and, and what we ultimately did in, in the incentive is uh, invest in the infrastructure and extension within the city uh, boundary in order to re-access for a builder uh, that access to margin so that it would incentivize the building within the boundary instead of just out. Okay, other? Yeah, I mean, I'll throw out that um, I, I mentioned already we're s spending a lot of state resources funding infrastructure to help bring projects to the table, which I think has been very effective. And local governments are excited about that because they get to, we grant only to local governments. So by doing that, we as a funder, we have some assurance that that project is well supported and is going to happen because the local governments are coming to us for the money. So we know that they're already on board with the project, which is great. And we're pushing through both of the incentive grant programs I mentioned, infill is a big part of it. I mean, we just aren't going to fund projects where you have to extend infrastructure way out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been great. Um, the other thing that we're focusing on though is you know, just per capita, per acre efficiency for water. And there's a couple of groups in Colorado that are really pushing for this. Um, our department leads this uh, Land Use and Water Alliance uh, coalition that's been really looking at this and partnering with different groups to do, 
you know, technical assistance like Growing Water Smart helps local governments figure out who is our water provider, how do we talk to them, how do we look at more efficient delivery of services. And so I think that's going to, in the long run, have a, a big impact as well. Okay. Christina, any thoughts? We had an initiative this year that failed. And it was, the idea was to have three or four developers come together and be able to issue a bond in order to finance. Yep. Yes. Similar thoughts on our ideas, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, didn't work out well. Yeah. And there are a number of reasons for that. <laughs> so that'll be something we're going to be tackling again this year. And and uh, the construct is to be determined, but I have a few ideas. So To we'll allow see. builders to bond the infrastructure. It wouldn't be a bonding mechanism. Um, at the, that didn't at go the developer le level. <laughs> yeah. Because again, you know, a taxing entity needs to have oversight. And so you don't want to put bonding authority, state bonding authority in the hands of the few. So yeah. that was really the nail in the coffin. Okay. So a different construct. But we do truly, we have thousands upon thousands of units that have already been through the process. They're entitled. It's getting that infrastructure to reach them. Infill is also another huge component of what we'll be tackling this year as well. Yeah. David? Well, uh, there was a phenomenal amount of pearl clutching around infrastructure when we were doing our middle housing law. And a, a lot of changing that conversation was make sure you're talking about the right thing again, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not a question of where are we gonna get the water for all these duplexes. The question is where are we gonna get the water for a million housing units? Mm -hmm. And I don't have a, a full answer to that question, but I think like the easy be baby step you can take is legalizing the type of housing that has the lowest per capita in water use, okay? You can start there, right? And um, we're, gonna, we're gonna work up. Um, in, in terms of actual hard funding of infrastructure, one of the things that we've done uh, recently is we've adopted what's called the CHIP program, connecting housing to infrastructure. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you ever worked with development fees or impact fees, you'll know local governments have limited authority to waive an impact fee just because they believe a certain development is in the public interest. They actually have to pay that on behalf of the development out of another funding source rather than the enterprise fund. What the CHIP program does is it provides state funding to backfill local governments who are willing to waive connection fees for affordable housing. So if you're willing to commit this as affordable housing, uh, we'll waive your, and, you're, and, and you're, you have the authority to waive that impact fee mm -hmm. because at the state level, we'll backfill, we'll pay that fee uh, on behalf of an affordable project. So it's, it's real money, all right, it's big money, but it's, uh, it's one of the ways we've done that in a way that makes sure that that housing also stays affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've been talking about regulations, zoning, all these facets. The other one we observed here was just, we have a just a root supply problem. We don't have enough carpenters, plumbers, electricians. Uh, how have you all addressed that issue and what have the results been? Emily, you wanna start with national policy? Uh, sure, well, I, this is um, a, an area that's a little bit outside of, of my area of expertise, but I will just say that the more severe the problem gets, the more this workforce issue is an issue because the workers can't afford to live in the places where um, the housing needs to be built. So addressing housing supply issues before they reach the, um, the severest level of affordability problems is the best solution, obviously, in, in places where those affordability problems are um, already very severe. That's not a lot of help, but <laughs> yeah. One, one thing we did that I did not mention was in 2021, we changed uh, our education laws that allow local school boards to allow high school students to spend two to 10 hours a week in the private sector and get high school graduation credit. So we have students now that are graduating from high school with an electrical apprentice certificate, or they spend five hours a week at a construction site, or it could be a law office, it could be an architecture firm, it could be a testing lab, it could be anything the student wants. Uh, we've typically worked with the local chamber of commerce on these things to get employer sponsors, and it, but we gave the ability to the local school boards to embrace these, we call them workplace learning experiences. Uh, so, and one school I toured recently are even doing this at the, uh, 
K through eight level. They have a full time employee at the uh, school district who arranges field trips for second graders to go walk through a manufacturing plant to say the only path is not just a four year degree in general studies. Maybe you want to build really cool stuff. And that just opens horizons for more kids. And it's one of the ways we're building this workforce. But I'd love to hear from you all on what you're doing for workforce. I guess I can speak for that from the workforce services aspect. So Governor Cox has made it uh, a state initiative that we no longer require college education for all state jobs. In the state of Utah, we believe not only that four-year educations and beyond are extremely important, but our on-the-job training and our technical colleges are also of equal, if not greater, importance, especially as we look at moving manufacturing, which is a huge component of our economy, back from overseas into the United States. We want to ensure that we are, we are setting ourselves up for success and that is not necessarily always the four-year degree track. So we incentivize through the Department of Workforce Services on the job training opportunities, um, various uh, certificate programs. The, it's a huge push for us. It has been for over a decade. Governor Cox just made it so it's not only localized um, at the employee level, but it's also a statewide initiative. We also have a, a return ship program that the Lieutenant Governor is spearheading. So we're working with uh, individuals who haven't been in the workforce for a number of years. We set them up with internships throughout the state in different departments. And then at the end of their internship, they are either offered a job in that particular department or they have opportunities elsewhere. So we're extremely supportive of that alternative means to providing a, a a good income for your house. Yeah, good. David, Washington? Uh, we import them from Montana. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> true. <laughs> I, I'm it's kidding. It's not sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably not. Um, well, yeah, we do a lot of the, the same things with, within um, apprenticeships, um, community colleges. We've got a big investment in the community college system. Um, I'll say this goes beyond the building trades. Uh, housing supply is a really complex yeah. uh, product that involves a lot of specialized expertise. And one of the things that's happened throughout the United States is a whole bunch of people that knew how to do everything associated with building a house, everything from a drywall contractor to a bond council. A lot of them lost their jobs when the housing market crashed 10 years ago, right? And if you know anything about uh, supply and demand elasticity, you know that supply is a lot stickier going up the, le up the scale than it is going down. So when all those folks left the industry because they, they had to eat, right? They, they, they had a family to feed, they're not coming back right away because they got burned. So that's, we're, we're coming out of a hole as a nation. Um, one of the things the legislature's asked us to do, partly as a result, a lot of the conversations we had over permitting is they're asking our department to have a strong look at the planning workforce, okay? Because local governments are saying we can't process permits quickly enough because we can't hire planners fast enough. Mm -hmm. Same is true with building officials and building inspectors who are the same people that are the advanced journey level contractors that all the builders are trying to, to, to hire to fix their crew. Um, one of the things I will say about small-scale multifamily is you don't need nearly as much specialized expertise. It's one of the reasons why construction costs are so much lower, right? If you've got, if you've got a pickup and some tools and you know how to build a single-family home, you probably know how to build a duplex. You don't need a welder. You don't need a rigger. Um, you don't need all that specialized expertise. So you can build in a lot more cheaply. It's much, much more scalable than conventional high-rise multifamily. Yeah. Other thoughts on workforce? Anybody else? Okay, contestants, we've come to the lightning round section of our program. And so I'm going to ask each person to offer two things. One is for people in the audience that are taking this away and they're going to go home and do the next thing, what's the best piece of advice you have for them? And then looking at your own horizon, what's the next thing you're going to do? I mean, what, what, so best advice to someone who's just getting started and then what's the next 
piece of lowest hanging fruit that you'll go after? And we'll start with you, Emily. Sure. Uh, my answer to both questions is, is related. And my best advice to state policymakers is to take a, a data-based approach to what is really moving the needle in terms of increasing housing supply and improving affordability um, in either a specific uh, locality or at the state level across the country. And my favorite part of my job is getting to work with policymakers um, in, uh, at all different levels of governments and in all regions of the country to share those those lessons um, so look forward to getting to learn um, from recent reforms in Montana Washington and and many other states about um, how we can really um, address this problem and you have resources on your website that people can download and get Absolutely, access to yep. yep. we have lots of lots of research available and I'm always more than happy to talk with um, any uh, public policy officials who are interested Great, thanks. Chris? Thanks, uh, Governor. I'd say the first thing is probably to be aggressive, and that the aggressive part is on scheduling. The, the, the more time you give to a problem, the more time you spend on a problem. So set an aggressive schedule and get to solutions, identifying as much as you can early on of what the problem is. Uh, an executive order really helps. It really does. It sets people afloat on a, on a good path. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is reconvene our housing task force. So I'll be doing that in June, uh, potentially July. And the objective there is to see how we did post-session and, and not lose momentum. So say post-session, we got this much through. Uh, and here's what we have left to to really focus on. Yeah, in my in the executive order we worked on, uh, you had two delivery dates. One yeah. was October 15th for uh, statutory changes that would improve access to affordable housing, and then there was a, a December 15th date for a report related to rulemaking that we could do without statute. That's right. Uh, and if people wanted to get a copy of those two reports, where would they get them? Uh, you can look at, um, I would say Google's the fastest way, but if you did uh, Housing Task Force Montana, it's on our DEQ website and there's a, the, all of the material plus uh, all of our meeting minutes. Uh, there's video, each of them are videoed. You can take a look at public comment and, and uh, all of the discussion that we had. And each one of them has, uh, what, 18 to 24 very specific very suggestions. Specific, yeah. uh, so thank yeah, you. Thank you. David. Um, one thing I would say is don't wait around for the legislature to tell you what to do. No doubt. Um, I'm assuming most of us here are from the executive branch. Start talking to people right away. Start talking to local governments right away about this issue. Um, think first about behavior. Um, and then if you need a change to the law, work for that. But start with what you can do with the authority that you have today. Um, that's the one thing I tell you to do. Start with what you've got. And the second thing in terms of what we're going to do is the next thing we're doing is we're starting to talk to local governments directly about what the rules mean, what they need to do, and what resources we can bring to bear to help them. There, again, no substitute for shoe leather. You've got to go out, build those relationships. You've got to start talking to people. Okay. Thank you, David. Christina. I would say standardization and investment. Uh, a lot of the problems that we see in increasing the supply are generally focused on those two arenas. Local municipalities who are not sufficiently staffed don't have the ability to craft ordinances that sure. meet state code. And as we change our land use regulations every year, that's significant. So the investment in uh, consultants, which is what we do, specifically attorneys that we hire on contract to work with our local municipalities. Um, and standardization, I've mentioned local road widths. We've got watered standardization for single family development, um, overseeing HOA requirements so that they're not prohibitive. Uh, there's a number of different things, but I really think that also the fire marshals and the building inspectors and building officials that is my big push. We'll see if I make any headway this year. But a standardized training program, because again, everybody is reading the IRC at a different, mm -hmm. with a different frame of mind, and we want to ensure that they, everybody is being held accountable and the process is transparent. It'll decrease the process times. Um, the second part of the the question, 
I, I, I think it's just the same answer, quite frankly. We are, I will say one thing that we are doing that I think is unique in the state is what I've been told. We have contracted with our Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute. We're currently building a database of all affordable housing, not only deed restricted uh, through federal resources, but also through our community reinvestment areas, et cetera. And we're overlaying the growth projections from our, um, from the same in order to specifically target investment of funds in areas that have access to transit, employment, and healthcare, and good schools. Rather than taking a, each municipality, I would caution you against doing this. Don't look at each municipality and say, you are required to build 200 units at 30% AMI because it's not strategically placed in a community, so it's actually counterintuitive. So using data and investing in data and keeping it up to date and making sure that you're making strategic placement decisions is of crucial importance. Okay, great. Andy? Yeah, there's some similarities from what others have said, so I'll try to be brief. As far as starting with what we can do now, um, we're going to continue, I know, to, um, the governor's been great about not just looking at state land, but encouraging local governments to look at the land that they own that could be, you know, used for affordable housing. And there's been a lot of success there. I know we're going to keep focusing on that. It's been a very effective strategy and people are excited about it. Um, you know, I think the other, the, the advice I guess I would say is continue to have the conversations that are necessary with the all the different groups that are necessary to figure out how do we reduce the barriers or the friction to get the development that we actually want to see. And that's a, just a sustained, long conversation. What's next for us? I think we're still debriefing. So I'll, I'll say, at least for me, that there was a lot of support um, with our land use bill for the state coming up with the data, right? Like share the housing needs data with local governments Housing needs assessments are expensive. You have to redo them so frequently. There's a role the state can play to at least set that foundation. And I think that's probably where we're going to go next. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing your expertise with this group. Can we give our panel a round of applause? And this is really the, the beginning of the discussion. So uh, let's keep sharing and dialoguing on this. We, we can solve this problem. Thanks for being here. Thank you.